church today. We're so glad that you are here. And why don't you turn around and say hi to two, three, four, five, five people around you. daughter Shannon. Where are you at, Shannon? Right there. She is home from deployment in Qatar with the Air Force. Right there. Thank you for your service. Let's give it up for Shannon today. Thank you so much. Thank you for your service. Hey, let's have a word of prayer and we will begin. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. We give you glory this day. We're going to worship you in spirit and in truth in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Here's what's happening at Kimberly City. Welcome Methodist to Kimberly Church. City Methodist Church. We're so glad that you're here today. We want to invite you to any of our three distinctive worship services. Uh, at 8 a.m. every Sunday morning, we have Front Porch Gospel. And it's a great uh, time of, of toe-tapping uh, bluegrass gospel music, and you'll enjoy it. 915, we have our traditional service uh, that has, it features our choir and our bell choir. And then at 1030, we have contemporary worship in the fellowship hall downstairs. Love to have you come each Sunday here at Kimberly City Methodist Church. invite you to a very, very special event on Sunday, July 23rd. Uh, the Ignite Choir from uh, Youth Choir from Illinois will be once again with us. They're, they're a favorite of our congregation. They've been coming for many years here. And uh, they're going to be at the 915 and 1030 services on July 23rd. It's, a, it's an event that you don't want to miss. Come and see the Ignite Choir Sunday, July 23rd. excited. Our next fifth Sunday sing is just around the corner, Sunday, July 30th. And uh, we're going to have one combined service at 9.15 a.m. and featuring the front porch gospel, uh, good uh, toe-tapping bluegrass gospel music on that day. And then immediately following the service, we'll be having a free pancake and sausage breakfast. And you are invited to that immediately following the one combined service, 9.15 a.m. on Sunday, July 30th.
show from Bible School. Look and enjoy, y'all.
all a song, everybody knows Jesus loves me, right? Well, this is a little different, Jesus loves me. So we're gonna teach it to all of you and I want all of you guys that were here for Bible school that sang, come up and sing with me. So I'm not up here by myself because Miss Debbie is ill this morning and she couldn't come help us sing. So all of y'all that are Bible school people, come on up here and we're gonna get crazy. The rest of y'all stand up because we're teaching you this. So you gotta come up, come on up here. Okay, now I put on my special glasses. <laughs> the problem with these glasses is I can't see nothing out of them, so I'm going to take them back off. So. All right, here we go. Here we go. Go for it. good time as you can tell from that wonderful video that our guys did thanks to Wes and Jim Potter and Bill Compton and Jim Nall I tell you it was it was just amazing so we appreciate that so much Becky Stacy was my co-director she played Goldie in the uh, video that you saw and they had a little bit every day she and Nick and it just gave me goosebumps because they were so good with each other and everything that it turned out. And then Lydia and Debbie were the same way. I had goosebumps every time they got up there and they kept telling me how they couldn't do anything and they, they just blew it away. It was just fabulous. So good. So anybody that helped with VBS in any way, would you hold your hand up if you came, if you help do something. So if you look around a little bit, you're gonna see a lot of people whose hands are in the air. That's not everybody though. That's not everybody. Because there were lots and lots of prayers from people that couldn't be there, you know, even out of town, but prayed for us anyway. 
to, to have our VBS be successful. And it was. And I felt really bad at first because you know I kept pushing for 30 kids. Some of us adults kind of acted like kids, but we, <laughs> di we didn't quite have our 30. We had 25. Yes. We had 25 kids. And I decided that God knew exactly what we could handle, and that's why we had 25. <laughs> so anyway, I just want you to know that Noel, my right-hand girl over here, made those wonderful black containers and, that said pennies for puppy or pets on there, and I had on top 100 pennies is a dollar. Well, we got a lot of dollars Fifth couple $50 bills. Dennis and I on Friday in the rain found our way to the Tri Lakes Humane Society in Reed Spring and we handed the manager of that organization $460. Unbelievable. I, we, it was just fabulous. Plus, over 200 worth of merchandise like cleaning supplies and dog food, cat litter, all that kind of stuff too. And then of course we had our box of our cat toys and our dog toys that we made. Also you saw the preschool making pine cones with peanut butter and bird seed on them and every, every kid took one home for, their, for the birds at their house. So that, that took care of all that. We got a call from the Lutheran Church in Branson that they are doing the same program the last week of July. And she wanted to know if we would be willing to let them use some of our materials. Checked it out with everybody. We, couldn't, we thought that was a good thing to do, so this coming Tuesday at 9 o'clock, she's coming over and she's gonna get to use, she's gonna get to take her posters, our little, do, little dog houses, all kinds of stuff. So, good opportunity. <laughs> Uh, one other thing, I wanted to tell you just how great this material is that we use. You saw the kids coming in and out of the tunnel. And I will just give you this as an example that sometimes life, life seems kind of dark and you're kind of down and things aren't going really well for you or anything. And just like in that tunnel, that tunnel was dark. I went through that tunnel and I taped, I taped those seams together that Pat Bingley and I tried to make and Anyway, but you know what? The second time they went through, they had a glow necklace with them, either wearing it or carrying it. If you have Jesus in your heart and Jesus is with you, he's with you in the dark times and the light times. Jesus is the light. So every game that you saw, every activity that we did had something to do with Jesus cares for you. And, and our Bible verse that you've seen all over the place, that's on the back of their little rovers. Everybody got a little dog tag with a rover on it. It's on, the, and they took those home, and we stressed that every day, too. So it was fabulous. Um, I, just, I just thank all of you for your support. Taking to have an event in Kimberling City and bring out a bunch of kids. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of understanding on that. And that is, uh, not very many people are from Kimberling City. At least not many that are here today. You realize this, right? Um, almost everybody here came to Kimberling City from somewhere else. And uh, most came here when they were over 60 years old. You know why? Because this is a place where people go to retire. And when you start talking about doing a big children's event when the young people are 60, um, <laughs> it is 
easier said than done to go out and find a bunch of kids and pull off an event. And so I have nothing but respect and admiration for all of the work and every person who participated in inviting and getting this thing to work. You guys are rock stars in my book. And uh, I, I mean that uh, as sincerely as I can possibly say it. That's an awesome thing to do. And uh, so uh, we have a lot of future things ahead of us, and um, I could say probably the majority of our growth here in the future is going to be folks who look like the people you see in the room today. Okay, however, we will never give up our efforts to reach children and teens and younger adults uh, to be part of this congregation. They're out there. It's just not in the same abundance in Kimberling City as you find people who look like us, right? And uh, so, yeah, you guys did an awesome job. I, I just love every, every moment of it and uh, so appreciate the work and effort everybody put into this. I'm going to get into the last message in this series. It's a wonderful life. This is a slightly different theme than what you would typically hear. And uh, this is going to get to the heart of a few things spiritually that you don't often hear spoken of these days. And yet these are some things pretty close to my heart. And I am convinced that this is very close to the passion and the heart of God for our lives. It's simply called when you never have enough. So in, uh, in preparing for this, I was thinking about uh, this movie, Wall Street. Anybody remember the movie Wall Street, Michael Douglas? Uh, so the character played by Michael Douglas in that movie is a guy named Gordon Gecko, and he makes a statement about a corporate CEO who has been astronomically unsuccessful every step of the way in business. And so when Michael Douglas' character, Gordon Gecko, mentions this guy, the statement he makes is, if this guy owned a funeral parlor, nobody would even die. <laughs> now, that, you know, that's a little bit of hyper hyperbole, but nevertheless, have you ever been around someone or known someone where it seemed like there's just this dark, ominous cloud hovering over their head and following them everywhere, and nothing seems to prosper. All of their efforts just seem to be some unseen failure. Something goes wrong that nobody would have anticipated, and everything seems to sabotage and collapse. They can never seem to get anything in the wind column. You ever seen anybody like that? Oh, let me tell you, I have. And, uh, one gentleman, in fact, and some of you may have even met him, he uh, uh, got his car uh, carjacked and got shot in the process. And talking to him, found out he had been shot another time as an innocent bystander. And uh, just start talking to him, and it's just his whole life was a series of events that happenstance could not explain adequately. The odds just don't work that way that, that, that one person could have that many horrible experiences without doing something to bring it on. And yet here it was. How do you explain that? Or maybe sometimes you feel that way about your own life, or at least a, a period of your own life. It's just like, man, everything I do, I can't seem to get a break. I can't seem to get ahead. And nothing seems to work. I listen to some younger people talking about uh, moving and planning and their investments and everything. And I was looking back and thinking, man, at that particular age, I wasn't thinking about investments. I was just barely surviving. You know what I mean? Just scraping by college years, getting out of the military and, and doing all those kind of things. It's not that way for everybody, but you've got some moments like that along the way in life, don't you? When enough, well, for some people enough is enough to pay the rent, utilities, and have enough groceries to eat. For others, enough is to keep up your uh, country club membership and uh, all of the other toys and things that we want. And even that doesn't seem like enough, right? So how we define that is a factor in this. But what I want to get into is this scripture that talks about the people of Israel and something that happened in their history that is a vital, vital lesson for us. And... Um, but as we delve into that, there's a couple of things you should know. One is simply this. God really wants to bless you. You might look and say, man, the circumstances aren't really showing that. God wants to fill your life up with good things, good experiences, uh, strong relationships that bring joy and happiness, meaningful experiences. 
For a lot of people, that doesn't seem to be happening, though. So I want to get into this scripture today, and I would just uh, gently challenge you to ask yourself, is this speaking to me today? Is God or is the Holy Spirit speaking to me through this scripture? Is there something in this for me? And I would trust that you will find some powerful encouragement as we get through this lesson in scripture today. Let's go to this uh, in Haggai chapter 1 and... uh, I had kind of messed up the slides on that earlier. Let's see how I'm doing it now. But it starts off with this. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Now, I want to try to make the connection between what the scripture would define as their ways and the experience they're having, because I believe that's what God is telling them. And the first part of that, God's word is saying to them, is this really the time for you to be living in these fine paneled, uh, luxurious homes while the Lord's house hasn't even been built yet? And then he says, consider your ways. And then goes on to say, look, look at the experience you're having. You eat, but you never, you're never full. You drink, but it's never enough. You put on clothes, but it doesn't warm you. In other words, you just never seem to have enough. Consider your ways. Now, the connection is this. These were the people who had returned from exile in Babylon. Cyrus, king of Persia, had provided security for their journey home, had issued the decree for them to return and build the temple. According to prophecy, he had fulfilled that. Not only that, provided financing and sent a huge caravan along the way that brought materials for the building of the temple. The whole plan was for these people to return to their homeland and build the temple of God. The prophecy had also said that Israel would be 70 years captive in Babylon. Now, they didn't all leave on the same day or even the same year. There was six, maybe even eight years of different groups of the Israelites being taken away into Babylon. Some of them were the later ones, the last ones to be carried away. And they were looking and counting up the years and they were saying, 70 years hadn't passed yet. We don't need to work on a temple. Think about this now. Our 70 years isn't up. We got these materials. Let's make some nice homes and take care of ourselves and let's get comfortable. Uh, we deserve this. Look at all we've been through. And they were, they were putting themselves first and making nice homes and living in comfort and luxury, but no satisfaction in life. Now, the issue was this. It wasn't that God had demanded they go ahead and start the temple, but it was the, where their hearts were found. Why, if you've got the means and the opportunity and God has provided the way for you to return to your homeland, would you wait and say, well, I'm not going to start on that temple until the full 70 years is up. I'm going to work on my own stuff now. That's what was going on. They had the means, they had the opportunity, had the resources, but instead of putting God first, they put themselves first. And God said, consider your ways. You want to know why you're not satisfied? You want to know why you're not being fruitful and fulfilled in life? Just think this thing through. You're saying it's not yet time to build the temple, and yet you're doing all of these other things and building for yourselves, even with the materials that were intended for the temple. You start to get the picture of this. That's what is happening in the lives of these people, and God is calling them to repent. So what would repentance look like for them? Well, it's just simply a matter of putting God first instead of themselves. Let me see if I can illustrate that. Uh, when you go out and eat at a restaurant, what is, the, what is the minimum acceptable amount to tip the servers? What do you think? Okay, is the minimum acceptable amount 10%? 
How many of you worked as a server? Do you like 10% tips? <laughs> but that would be like the bare minimum, right? Is it required to, to leave a gratuity or a tip in a restaurant? Will they arrest you or something if you don't? It's not required. So do you have to? You ever have wealthy friends who don't tip? <laughs> do you like going out with them? How do you think the servers like them? <laughs> or the person who even says, well, the minimum required tip is 10%. And so they carefully calculate right to the penny and never give more than that. And you're like, why not just figure 20% and round it up to the next dollar or the next $5 or whatever, right? When people are trying to make a living. What is in our hearts and our minds and our values and our way of thinking when that's our approach to it? Where we say, well, if it's not required of me, I'm not giving it. Isn't that what the people of Israel were doing? Well, it's not required. We don't, we got seven more years before it's time to build the temple. Let's make some nice homes. Keep it. Keep the materials. You start to get this. The repentance involved putting God first. You see, they started building the temple after this uh, prophetic message from Haggai. Now, would, have re would, would it have been repentance if they said, oh, man, okay, guys, look, God says we got to go build this stupid temple, okay, so let's go do that, or God's probably going to be mad at us from now on. We better get this thing done. If we ever want God to bless us, we better build this thing. Is that repentance? No. There has to be a change in their heart where they want that to happen, where they say the temple to us is more valuable than a luxurious, comfortable home for ourselves because the whole reason of being here was to build the temple of God. It comes first in our thinking, our priorities. We can't even imagine not doing it this way. So they had to come to their senses and have a change of heart. That's what it looks like. When that happens in our lives, we put ourselves in the place of blessing with God. That's what we're getting at. So let's get back into this, this scripture and talk about it just a little bit. The very first lesson out of this is simply, he, God, is with you. Verse 13 says, Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. You see, God's not saying, nope, I'm abandoning you. You abandon me. I'm ditching you. Forget it. That's not the way it works. God starts off the message of return and repent with, I'm with you. See, we tend to think of the Christian life of God is waiting for us at the finish line. If we can be faithful, if we can hold out, we can make it to the end that there's God waiting at the finish line. That's not the message. The message is God's with you right now. God's with you every step along the way. He's not going to leave you, not going to forsake you. And when you acknowledge this, God will begin to stir your spirit. When you realize God's with me right now, God should be first in my life. Look at what God has invested in loving me and having a relationship with me. And you begin to understand and acknowledge that. It's going to stir up your spirit to a place of obedience. It says in verse 14, <clears throat> Then they began to work on the house of the Lord. And I'm convinced it wasn't a situation of the prophet coming in and gathering a few other leaders up and going around and making rules and uh, passing an edict. No more working on your houses till this temple is done. Get over here, everybody, and work on this temple. Then you can go to it. It's not like that. God isn't just something we put in our time with or do what we have to so we can do the stuff that we really like. God becomes the stuff we really like what we want to do. And so their hearts changed and they began building the temple of God. This was the big change. And this changed in God's uh, ability to bless them. And that's why the second big thought here is the best is yet to come. Verse six and seven, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth. 
the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and the desired of all nations. That's, by the way, a reference to Jesus. The desired of all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord. I'm going to shake it all up again and I am going to fill this. They ain't built it yet. I will fill this house with glory. Pretty good stuff, huh? And get this, God told them, whatever has been destroyed, I'm going to rebuild it. If we look at our lives and what's happened through, what, two and a half, three years of the COVID thing, other experiences that this church and community had during that time, and we look and say, man, we've taken a big setback. This has been a hard hit. I don't know if we can recover from this. When we turn our hearts to God and get on the path of blessing, you know what? God destroys, God rebuilds everything that had been destroyed, excuse me. Everything that has been taken away, God returns it and multiplies it. Getting on the path of obedience to God and being in the right place of blessing makes all the difference. We'll get back to that in just a few minutes and discuss that a little bit more. And God also said to them, you have not yet had your best year. They were looking back and saying, man, our, you know, our, our fathers and our grandfathers, man, before the carrying away to Babylon and all that, they had the best times. And what we have will never amount to that. The great temple of Solomon was destroyed. That'll never be returned or anything. And God says to them, you haven't even had your best year yet. Better stuff is coming. And I believe the same thing applies to you and your life and to this church. We haven't seen our best years yet. The best is not behind us. It's still yet to come. We have put ourselves in a pathway of great blessing, and now let's stir up our hearts to see what God is going to do with that, which is then verse 9 tells us, and God spoke to the people and said, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. That's referring to the temple. Solomon's temple in all its glory got destroyed and they rebuilt the temple at this particular time and God says the, the glory of this one will be even greater than what you saw before for all that was lost during the COVID years with the, uh, having uh, people leave the church and all of those things that happened God says the glory that you're going to find now is even greater than before all that started to happen I'm healing that. I am restoring that. I am rebuilding all that was destroyed and then some. God is speaking to us through this and letting us know that there is promises in place for us. There is more than hope for us. There is great glory ahead for the people of God. The third main thought of this was simply this. The blessings begin today, or can at least. See, one thing that Haggai the prophet points out through the inspiration of God in this was, see, if uh, the Old Testament ceremonial law was there to illustrate spiritual truths, and they had ceremonial law, for example, if they were to touch something unclean or defiled, then they themselves were considered unclean, and then until they were cleansed of that, everything else they touched would also be unclean or defiled. That was, you know, the holy and unholy, clean and unclean, uh, pure and impure, all, all of that. It was for them to learn that obedience puts you in a path of blessing and disobedience puts you in a path of, well, not so much blessing, right? They were starting to get that. You see, their sin had defiled them. And everything they touch and everything they tried to do kind of had that dark cloud over it. But wait a minute. If their sin had defiled them, what was their sin? Having a house? Was that a sin? No. The sin was simply they didn't put God first. God didn't really matter to them. You know, it's like, well, we'll go to church, but we're, we're, we're not going to get all excited about it. We're not going to volunteer. We're not going to uh, 
financially supported or uh, this whole thing of the gospel, the Great Commission. We're not going to start sacrificing and dedicating our lives to the Great Commission, but we'll go to church, and if there's a need, we'll help, right? But they didn't love God. They hadn't put God first in their lives, and that was the sin they needed to repent of. But they did. Oh, they did. Verse 19, God said, from this day on, I will bless you. When they changed their hearts, they went with enthusiasm and passion to go build the temple of God. And God says, there you are. From this day on, I'm going to bless you. Let me explain something real quick. This isn't called out nearly often enough in our world today. Some people probably get mad at me for mentioning it, but we got to talk about this. All around us, churches and Christian people are being swept along with this just flood of cultural decay and social uh, issues and values that, that are completely at odds with the Bible and Christian values. Churches are being swept along with the tide of that to where churches and entire denominations have abandoned the gospel and hardly even realize it. Instead of the Great Commission now, they've got the great climate justice, social justice campaign going. And nobody gets saved. Nobody comes to Jesus. But oh my goodness, they are certainly trying to push a political issue that they think is going to make the world a better place. And along with that comes moral decay and acceptance of the most perverted, the most unthinkable types of behavior and absolute sin. And the church embracing that and advocating it and promoting it. Friends, that is what the Bible prophesied that we would see in these days. The Bible calls it apostasy, abandoning the truth, exchanging the truth for fables and lies. The believer is told, come out from among them, be separate, and I will bless you. The Christian is told, touch not the unclean thing. That whole thing of the ceremonial law of the Old Testament wasn't so much about touch this or don't touch that. It was about where we are spiritually and what we stand for. You guys looked at this last, last year, started over a year ago, studying, looking at what was happening, analyzing it, and realized we have got to leave a denomination that has abandoned the gospel. And you made the hard decision, and you did that. Friends, do you not believe that something that big and putting God first and returning to the gospel is going to put you on a path of blessing? The good things of God are coming your way. Fruitful ministries, abundance, that's the promise of God. thing about it is you should believe that. That this decision wasn't just an administrative thing that uh, uh, puts us in a more convenient situation. No, it was a step of obedience. To be true to the gospel, to be faithful to God, and to live out our lives dedicated to the great commission and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friends, that's where the blessings are. Make no mistake about it. You won't find these blessings anywhere else. And you've chosen that path. Big decision. Courageous decision. Now expect to see the blessings. You see, these people were stuck in a cycle of never, never having enough as long as they refused to repent. That cycle continued. They were just flowing along not thinking about why I don't put God first, why I'm not faithful to the truth of God's word. But something shook them up and they reconsidered that and turned their hearts to God and put God first. And God says the blessings begin right now. I want you to know God's blessings begin for you. 
we're going to celebrate this. As a matter of fact, we got through the annual conference and, and everything. We realized to have a big celebration right now. We're all a little bit tired. We're going to get a couple of months of recovery and get into this. But the other thing we're going to start doing is I'm going to do some more of the informational sessions about our future and about what this means for us, where we are now. I know that a lot of you have got questions about what, what does this mean? Where do we go next? How does this happen? For now, recognize you're on the path of blessing. We're going to, in about next month, begin some of those sessions talking about the future and our possibilities, all those kind of things. How will we do things different? All of that kind of thing. Uh, but we are also going to have a huge celebration. I believe that God is honored by us doing that. And so that's all in the cards for us. But let me wrap up with what is it I think you can take home today? Here it is. First of all, the point of this message is not... All of our problems are the result of our sin. That's not the issue. No, not at all. I'd prefer to look at it this way. When we walk in obedience, God can bless us the way he wants to. And we have certainly taken the steps to be in the place of obedience. Take comfort in that. Take some encouragement in that. Let that just be a, a, a great source of enthusiasm to you to recognize what did we decide to do? We decided to put the gospel first. We decided we're going to live for the Great Commission to bring people to Jesus Christ. We're not going to be swept away from that, though all the rest of our culture chooses otherwise. Courageous and bold step that you've taken will put you in a place of blessing as individuals and as this church. And finally, God will move heaven and earth to restore what is broken in your life and to begin blessing you right now. The promises of God fulfilled in you. What a beautiful picture. Just as it was in Israel at that time when they had lost focus, hadn't they? They had got all caught up in themselves. We deserve this. We've lived so rough. and Now we deserve all this. But wait a minute. You're doing all that and you haven't put God first. I'm going to have to deal with this. It's just like, well... I don't, I'm not required to tip. I'm not going to do it. Or, well, 10% is the minimum required we hear. That is $3.61 there, right? Not a cent more. God is not about doing just the minimum required of us. It's what is the maximum I can do to put God first? How can my life most exemplify the values that God wants to see? And Quick, quick tip on this. It's not about going around acting all pious and super religious or anything. That's, that's not it at all. But loving people around you, showing them what Jesus does for them, now you're starting to find it. Let me just so ask you to pray with me now. We'll get this wrapped up, all right? God, as we turn our